be this is going to be introductory because uh, I was asked to do the, the style. So it's going to be a fruit salad of a variety of things with some math. So it's deliberately vague in some aspects. But there is an encouragement to any of you to stop me on the spot and ask for more details if you want, or just add any question. This is supposed to be as interactive as you want to be, or just hold on to whatever pressing thing you have and ask at the end, whatever makes you feel good. But just don't be shy. Um, and I'm, I'm aware though, I self declared, and I collaborate with a bunch of others, <laughs> which is uh, the, the sort of grocery list in there with the highlights uh, just in bold for young people because young people should be bold. Uh, so this this is the spirit. Uh, and I the title is also a little bit vague uh, deliberately because um, I tend to operate in theoretical states mostly. Um, but in practice this is going to be mostly about dynamics of global and past in the old pressure states or new pressure uh, as I'll try to highlight. So this is my opening statement. Fight me in this in the sense that I really think that there is uh, scope for going back to do some of the old stuff in stellar dynamics, particularly targeting this uh, class of small stellar system. And it's not just by a random chance, but because there is a set of um, circumstantial lucky alignment that we should be taking advantage of. So, first of all, there is a lot of new observation things. And as I said, I'm taking this with a lot of admiration as a theorist because. I kind of exist because some good data are now available, otherwise all my work would be completely useless. Uh, and much of this is coming in the form of Gaia. This was the representation that we had for the Milky Way uh, upon the first data release. Data release. Three, this is the first asymmetric one early, data release three. And the next one is what we have in full data. So it's, you see that even just visually, this is the magnitude of the information that is available in terms of just velocity space or packing of information in there. Of course, I'm interested in selected portions, but this is really the magnitude of variation with respect to stationary Milky Way, with respect to a dynamic Milky Way, as we can experience it. Just so we can call this in a fancy way a precision galactic storm. Um, this means that many uh, outcomes for a variety of sectors, but in particular, one that may be of interest and was already popping up in conversation this morning, is related to the use of globular cluster in this context as beacons of the information connecting uh, well, their own role with respect to the environment within which they live. And this comes usually in the form of response from perturbation that they experience in the final field of the Milky Way itself. So, this is one particularly Tracy or, or uh, trendy topic of the moment, which is the study of the tidal tails as emitted from the global cast themselves, which is the blob at the center. This is the poster child for this type of uh, research program, which is the case of Palmer 5, which is really uh, manifesting since uh, pre Gaia era uh, this, this characteristics distribution of mass in the form of the two tails that are emerging from the Lagrangian points uh, of the, the original. We now have many, many more of those, and there is a literally an industry in the field designed to find them, exploit them, and typically use them to reconstruct um, information that are of galactic interest, meaning uh, the uh, mass and the elongation and other characteristics of the dark field of our own. So this is one way to do this already level of exploitation. Um, there are others that are even more new and, and puzzling with respect to the case of PAL5, and this is the case of the long stream of Omega Centauri, which is another poster child of the cluster, which is a bit more controversial. Uh, but nonetheless, it's already uh, kind of making some headlines in terms of its discovery and, and the role of uh, this particular structure in the context of the progenitor and other surrounding streams that have been discovered through uh, the exploitation of the Earth. So um, this, this is already something that carries a lot of information that is beyond just practical use of global customs. And then of course, this going back to the idea of why the observational landscape is changing so dramatically. The other significant uh, new player in the field is of course the advent of gravitational wave astronomy, uh, excuse me, astronomy, <laughs> uh, a, a bias. Um, this is uh, connected to the role of collisionality in the sense of collision of stellar dynamics in this particular class of uh, object global cluster, mostly because this type of demographics of stellar mass black hole was not accessible at all before this. 
And now this was, I think, an incarnation early in the whole business. Now this is the graveyard plot uh, in its latest incarnation, almost checking the sense that in the sense that just a, a visual scale for the fact that the demographics now is emerging, we are progressively learning about uh, everything that is a compact object. We cannot see that these are LIGO black hole estimated. In orange, you have LIGO neutron stars that are just these very few ones at the moment. Then you have some electromagnetic counterpart black holes in uh, reddish, and then the electromagnetic counterpart neutron stars. This is already kind of staggering. And the whole impact in my particular business of an information like this goes in the spirit of how should we create this particular stellar mass binary, stellar mass black hole binaries, and a counterpart object, even in the form of perhaps hybrid system black hole plus neutron stars and other more exotic combos, uh, in conjunction with the dynamical state of the environment that we may relate to pop up up there in particular. So there is a big debate in the field that we were discussing this morning on how to generate uh, the kind of binaries that will eventually emerge and produce um, a gravitational wave signal. And there are two camps in the field of one advocating for stellar evolution and only type um, channel. So you're having your binary that is formed in an environment that is not necessarily dynamical, but it's just evolving from its life in certain conditions for mass, and you generate something that will eventually be binary. Uh, and the other camp, which is the one kind of exploiting uh, the, the sort of dynamical state of the star cluster and the high density environment, is generating your, binary, your black hole uh, by themselves and then having a very high chance of interaction when generated by evidence. So there is a lot of exploitation about this, and uh, much of this um, use of the collisionality or the high degree of density of this field is particularly related to. And crunching number and generating predictions or merger rates um, that ultimately is deemed as particularly interesting to for, um, for a variety of um, application in different disciplines. This is not just the only element of revolution, as I was saying at the beginning, there are three of them. So we did the observation of it, and it was really the novelty aspect of this. Um, so there is a computational also um, revolution, I would say. This is very niche in the sense that this is my people. These are the weirdo that are obsessed about the gravitational temporal. And this goes with a specific flavor of numerics, which is what we try to call embody simulation, in the sense of just sitting there in front of your computer and try to solve the medium equation of motion exactly without cheating, without putting gas. I apologize for reading this morning <laughs> to the relevant people here. Just so a purely stereodynamical exercise. But really try to evolve this without any sort of cheating in the sense of softening or other numerical approximation that often we have to do when you're scaling up the problem to numbers that are even higher than a million. So this was a big target for our community to be able to run a million ball simulation, honestly, uh, and to see if we're recovering all the phases of, of theoretical expected type of mechanism and ultimately generating something useful that is also fed up with the and this has finally been achieved, and it's has been a milestone with a lot of hardware and software development required. Um, this is paired up with respect to a uh, kind of nice convergence of people, in the sense that even people that are doing normally with like ecological losses, large volumes, and progressively kind of getting worried about numerical accuracy there and what that means in this context, are just in general getting interested in the smaller scale. This is a very dangerous thing you can try to make if you're a cosmologist, because this is where everything in terms of the medical schemes that are usually adopted in that context breaks down. So there is a lot of uh, tension, but also, as I said, convergence in between these two approaches. But as you probably see in more or less every week of the archive, there's always now an attention to try to go for high resolution, still within a cosmological setting, and try to make statements of a medical investigation for the formation of small scale and in some cases even particularly information protocol or cluster um, in the context of uh, not just galactic scale environment but a cosmological which is a mess in the sense that I don't think that we have any set of state of it. Um, but there is this general tension and ideally the two communities but communication one this is I would call our side my left side collision of people and this is certainly collision less um, and there are good reasons to make a distinction. Uh, 
The binding principle will be if you are progressing the attack in similar physics. Not finished quite yet with this long introduction, because really what is of key importance to me is the idea that there is a change in the conceptual understanding of this class of analysis. Meaning that typically we assume dogma has to be nice follows times, well behaved object, typically almost a sole problem in many respects. Uh, and this was also because the quality of the data available to us was up to a certain level, both in the photometric information as well as spectroscopic one. So, this is like kind of thing that created an illusion that we fully understood this class of objects, really. Uh, and, and in a sense, there was no need for further investigation. So, in this period, I agree, this is still a very good baseline. And this is my sort of zero order mathematical slide. Uh, just to give you a sense of the kind of tool that one can still use with, with profit, I would say. So my tag is that there is everything that really counts at the zero order dynamical level captured into a single equation, which is that distribution function. If you ever seen this before, you may recognize that this is what we call King models from Ivan King. Still having a little ball every time that I mention his name. <laughs> Uh, but the idea is that ultimately what it says is just that is some description for a spherically symmetric um, uh, portion of the phase space. I can see this because it's just depending on E, which is the single star energy that you see represented there, kinetic plus the overall gravitational potential is there. Um, and it's beautifully capturing the idea of relaxation because you see that there is just this pure exponential dependence, E to the I, E, there. And you see that the only thing that is slightly unusual is that there is a truncation that the main is not the full space. I'm having a top value uh, of energy that I allow myself to define as a cutoff, which is the E knots there. This means in heuristic term that I'm not allowed to go to every possible level of energy I want. There is a maximum one that is set by the fact that the ball starts a ball, <laughs> a finite size, and the size in itself, which is this energy level, is set by the tidal environment. So I'm having a boundary that is set by subgravity at some point is not counteracting with respect to a tidal perturbation with the galactic environment. And that's it. I'm just making the whole thing slightly fancy because I'm having continuity over my cutoff. So if I plug in E naught over um, the, the crossing point, you see that it goes zero and zero, so it's continued, but it's not smooth. It's this first derivative. I don't care, but it's just um, a representation that, in principle, provides you, and did this is the 60s, with a very good uh, description just based on this idea that the system is thermodynamically relaxed in the same spirit as Maxwell uh, intuition for it in the case of ideal gases. And this is just already what was the agreement in photometry, this is a historical representation from the 60s, uh, from one of the early tests that, that I ran. So this still works. Capturing the zero order dynamics, and we should all have, I think, a moment of appreciation for it. But there is more now in the sense of not just the zero order that we can rely on because the quality of the data is better. And with the quality also depends in the sense that now we have the evidence that dog broadcasters are not just co evil in their stellar population. There is plenty, I think, also in this case, I kind of decided to use historical plots. This was one of the first realization through a Hubble photometry that there was a split of the, the main sequence uh, of the stars in 2808 and from the longer cluster in the Milky Way, um, indicating complexity that we didn't expect at the time, we still don't understand. And this had a counterpart problem in the um, chemical arrangement side of the story, in that manifests itself with a variety of correlation between light and particular pairs of light that's maintained. This is the very famous one, sodium oxygen anticoagulation, which at some point in the field has been proposed to be the actual definition for what a dog broadcaster is, which is a system that shows sodium oxygen anticoagulation. I reject this definition personally just because there's <laughs> not enough dynamics in it. But it's just to say that it's an ambiguous feature at this point. And there is a lot of uncertainty related to the full understanding of how this kind of feature are actually coming. But this is the new state of the art. Uh, observational characteristics. And then this comes in, this is where I kind of uh, get a little bit more emotionally involved <laughs> in the sense that 
Yes, I kind of made a case for the, the both of stars and being sufficiently captured by just the dependence in energy, which is very proximity, no rotation, no uh, anisotropy. But indeed, we did, we did already have evidence for this pre Gaia, and I'm being a bit self referential here. Uh, just because when I started my own thesis, uh, and this was done in collaboration with a master's student at the time, uh, when I was going around and advocating for the presence of rotation in the upper cluster, people looked at me with the eye with a mixture of, of pity and despair <laughs> to say, Why are you losing your life <laughs> to do stuff like this? Everyone knows that a cobra cluster is round um, and there's no hope, and why would you even try to measure it? Uh, it's still a minor, I'm going to call it a minority climatic effect in the sense that it's still subdominate with respect to the overall energy budget for the system. But nonetheless, now we can measure rotation curves, like the beautiful one in 47 tuck. We have counterpart information on the plane of the sky. This was just a, a reminder for the thing that can be done even in integrated light. And now, of course, Gaia is provided with all the supplementary information that I'll discuss more in a minute. And this summarizes into the idea that cobra clusters are no longer good to solve the problem anymore. And I'm making another uh, reference here to one particular effect related to how ignorant still are we regarding the behavior in the outside. So much of the historical information and data available really refer to the central to the intermediate region. And the stuff that is at the boundary or, or the border of the other stars is very ill-defined by the structure. Picking our stars observation is very complicated, and having a statistical statement regarding the membership of little star with the very faint outside is even more so. Nonetheless, people are getting a bit excited about this because when you try to do this, you may start discovering there is additional material that you wish to state as belonging to the cosmic cluster itself, which is beyond this kind of nominal truncated uh, radius that one may expect to have. Even on the basis of the King Walker like type of interpretation. So, this shows up in photometry. I'm making an example here out of 1851, but there are others that do show similar characteristics. Sometimes they're called envelopes, sometimes they're spherical, sometimes they're a bit elongated, but they, they kind of show up in the form of material that necessarily shouldn't be there. And some, when you're having a lucky situation that allows you to measure kinematics and to get a range I have to be able to vector for is. Um, really a non-trivial thing to do, but sometimes you can. And you're tempted to co construct a velocity dispersion profile, as in this case. In some cases, this is staying flat, and in some cases, some people have been saying that it's a rising slope. This was a statement made over even some interpretation of the R2. And at that point, people are getting all excited and they're doing kind of better looking at the part and say, oh, maybe there is a book for having a dark matter immediately. So why not? And so the whole debate also carries logical flavor. And in general, it's a very tricky thing to try to address, but it's one topic which there is research and is periodically being addressed in the field. It's not the first time this is coming up. Uh, so this is this is another statement. And this is even more timely because um, I was trying to focus myself on classical globulars at this stage, but there is now a jungle of objects that are being discovered, as I was saying almost jokingly this morning, when I started my PhD thesis, we had 150 of cluster in as well. Now I think there are 170 in counts. And this is not even considering the other zoology of things that are essentially small objects that we are not even able to classify as star cluster or accounts. And this carries that implication regarding any possible thermic content. Because when probably around about the 80s, one was tempted to make um, a science mass plot for everything that we know from the elliptical to small object. This was probably a fair depiction of reality. We have a very clear distinction between something that was an elliptical for biology versus something that was a small thing in a star cluster. Now the reality is looking a little bit more like this. It says it is precisely this kind of jungle that I was hinting at. And you have your own definition of what an ultra dwarf is, or an ultra phase star cluster, or an extended cluster of phase fuzzy, phase satellite. This is not even up to date. This is like I was doing this as a kind of a personal exercise, and I stopped at some point, so I apologize. I'm probably missing a lot of new discoveries. But just to say that the idea of tracing a boundary between who's who is a non trivial exercise, and it's not just a semantic one, it really carries the 
this information on um, what should we do also regarding the economical tool to take your information. So in this context, um, I try to go back to the roots as much as possible, and I try to think about fundamental economical effect. So uh, now you're going to get two exercises from me yeah, with that bit of mathematics that I was uh, hinting at. And they're both related to um, the case of kinematic complexity. So the idea of bringing in more stuff in the phase space, understanding beyond the classical idea that I expect to see next time. So this means mostly in my definition there, angular momentum and velocity and isotopy, and isotopy in the architecture. So all question number one, which is very niche, I appreciate this, but there we go. Let's assume that I'm building up an equilibrium. So a, a theoretical mathematical model that is showing uh, some degree of rotation and anisotropy, say so the velocity space. How do I know whether this thing is going to keep it together or if it's going to become unstable and show some features that are associated with, with uh, dynamical instability or longer term instability or not? And why do I care about this? Because I, otherwise I'm making a mistake assuming that something is going to stay as it is uh, or it's just going to evolve by itself, just driven by some source of this. So this is the playground and this is the, the heavy slide there with me again. Uh, but it's just to give you a sense and nothing more than this, that there is a jump, of course, between an exponential function and the stuff that you need to do mathematically in order to make sense this additional complexity. But it's still something that one can do penetrate. So there is a there is scope, uh, at least from my perspective, to do this. So don't get fooled. This is just a distribution function that is uh, depending on the energy and the modulus of the angular momentum. So it's something that is potentially still static in this case, but it's just spinning and also having some preferential distribution of the shape of the vortex in here. And it's coming into this flavor with this funny fractional dependence in the energy and h is just one hypergeometric function that a guy uh, in the eighties was able to, to construct in order to build a model that preserved the same structure of a plumber sphere. And this is a very common kind of density potential here that we often use. It, in its vanilla form is uh, isotopic. And in this particular arrangement of modification, that in the case of all the parameters that are non trivial going to zero, falls back into your plumber structure. It's just having some degree of anisotropy, which is this beta profile, uh, which is just very simple. This is the advantage of uh, the, the cost that you're paying for the structure of the distribution function itself. And it's just, this is the spherical radius, uh, so regular spherical coordinate here. And Q is the only thing that you should care about. It's just a measure of the type of anisotropy that you have. When Q is positive, it's radial. Q is zero, is isotropic. And Q negative means tangential. And this means just the, the relative shape of the orbit uh, that you have. Um, in principle, one can take this to the extreme, and Einstein actually did it as, I think, a side project when he wasn't thinking about <laughs> this other stuff that made him famous. There is a limiting case for Q tended to infinity, which is just the case of a sphere still preserving whatever structure of orbit that you like that is made up of perfectly circular orbit, randomly oriented. So uh, this is just a, a, a historical loop. And you can kind of operate. You can build up the corresponding beta profile. They're not scary looking at the same. They kind of stay isotropic in all cases at the same time. If you have the trivial cases stay flat just because it's isotropic in that case, or you can go negative or even more so uh, if you're tangential. This means uh, that also the shape of the corresponding velocity dispersion moment will change, but otherwise the structure is the same. Again, uh, extra flavor that we're putting in, uh, another moment of appreciation for another giant in the cell. This is a very clever trick that you can do with your favorite model in any organization. You're just spinning a certain fraction of the orbits uh, that are available to you. And this mathematically means that I'm flipping um, the order of the even path of the distribution function with respect to a certain normalization factor. Again, this just means that I am allowing myself some degree of rotation in the system. When that alpha is zero, means no rotation. When the alpha is one, means maximally spinning sphere. And it's, again, just kind of a mathematical trick. And this is the kind of shape that you have for the resulting rotation. I'm finished with, with the heavy stuff. The whole idea is that this particular playground that is a bit uh, involuted, but not too much, allowed us to explore this parameter space of anisotropy 
and rotation from zero to drawing from isotropic to radial in this direction and tangential in this direction. And there is a very classical regime that uh, falls back into the expected radial orbit instability. If you have too many radial orbits, this is not keeping it together. It will just bounce into the form of a cigar. And this was well known since the beginning. So if you push your degree of result to that regime, we recover the idea that this is indeed unstable. So this was kind of nice and, and expected to send. But we push the exploration to this tangentially and isotropic region, and we discover a full island of unstable modes in the sense of characteristics of instability that were new entirely. Uh, there is also, I'm, I'm kind of hiding a little bit under this swamp uh, of uh, blue area there, in the sense that this was an issue of how much we could detect in terms of just a mathematical way of measuring this growth. Uh, this is the mathematical approach, let's say it's a linear stability method. We call it matrix method in jargon. And this is the genuine end body assessment that returns the same thing. But the idea is that probably, and I'm actually almost ready to bet money on this, there is a degree of uh, instability that is very slowly growing that is even available for lower level of rotation here, and potentially even more rotation. I think that these things will be. But uh, this is a bet that is corresponding to what you. So this is just to make a case in quantitative terms that uh, stuff are potentially more interesting and more dynamically unstable than we originally envisaged. And we normally don't even think about this portion of the parameter space altogether. And you might say, well, who cares about tangential and isotropic stuff? This is nuts. And yet tangential and isotropy is coming about in a variety of settings, often scaring people because they don't quite know what to make of it. So I think that there is value in doing this kind of uh, exploration, even an idealized Second question relates still to this idea of bringing in more complexity into the problem. Uh, and this may be of interest to, to Mike and others. This is going into beyond the dynamical time scale of this one that is relevant to the previous class of instability. It's going really into the long term dynamical. So, a bit of explanation here. This is a representation of the size of the core of uh, a cluster or a uh, an in-body simulation as a function of time measured with respect to one particular class of unit, this is the half mass relaxation time at the initial time. If you have a sense of what this means, this is uh, a long time scale in the lifetime of a collision object. Um, a time scale that is the crossing time is order of minutes in the life of a cluster. Um, something that is secular would be order of hours. This is order of, let's say, days or months, depending on the type of models that you're considering the initial. But the idea is that it's kind of capturing as a unit the long term evolution of this particular collision length. And what we see, let's take the, the vanilla case first. This is the red. Different lines correspond to just different red organization. This is a well known fact. What we're seeing here is a progressive contraction of the core at this central region of this water, which corresponds to the phenomenon of gravothermal uh, catastrophe uh, or, or gravothermal instability. You're just progressively um, creating a separation between the core and the halo structure of the system, and as a result of the fact that these type of systems do have negative capacity. I'm going to leave it there. If you want to have a session related to gravothermal catastrophe itself, we can have it. But the whole idea is that this expectation was well posed and well known. We know that this kind of phenomenon is taking place. And what we wanted to explore was the fact that a um, different type of initial condition may move this moment of this process of core collapse around in conjunction with the type of physics that you're. And indeed, if you use the same sphere that I described before, so this little two is the same sphere as in the previous setting, um, if you have something that is radially and isotropic, this is the blue, you see that you're achieving, keeping everything else the same, just cranking this degree of isotropy. You're achieving core collapse at the later stage. You're having tangential isotropy, collapse much faster. In some cases, it's a statistically um, hypothetical Einstein sphere just for, for the sake of completeness being theorists. You see that this is a very catastrophic behavior. It's actually achieving what perhaps in a very much shorter period. But this was completely unexpected to me. When I saw this plot the first time around, I had a half an heart attack in this is saying, what? <laughs> this wasn't quite expected, or at least we never really thought about it. 
because the idea was that, of course, initial conditions, they don't matter. Yes, they will be just washed out. Then some degree of anisotropy will be just progressively being erased uh, by the system by this kind of very efficient mechanism of uh, transport of energy and I'm due to the free body interaction. But indeed, they do matter. And we should be start exploring them uh, as, as a systematic case. Uh, and of course, the whole idea requires carefulness in making this comparison. And it's crucial to the fact that we had this kind of playground where the structure of models that we were comparing to one another were exactly the same in this numbers. This is also true for rotating. So those that I just showed were having no rotation in all cases, just anisotropy to keep the whole thing distinct and understand. We also did the same experimentation with anisotropic rotating sphere, which is a bit more complicated today. It's still the reference money in this case. But the whole thing that seems to emerge here is the fact that if you're having a rotating sphere, this is collapsing faster or reaching core collapse faster than a non rotating sphere. And this is stuff that I still don't understand, but it's still unpublished, because uh, this was an evidence or an observation that was already made. But with an explanation that was invoking an additional mechanism called possibly gravel uh, gyro instability, which is a mirror image of the gravel thermal one, invoking the presence of a negative inertia moment as a negative instability. And I don't think I understand this yet. <laughs> so uh, I'm showing this as, as just a piece of evidence, but as I said, we don't have back theory. Uh, and I don't particularly subscribe to this whole idea. I'll take this as a tangent to the conversation before. But the, the key message here is really the fact that we're able to modify classical mechanism just by having this imprint of different classical ingredients in your system and you should be paying attention to this. So why this is still relevant to I say, well, fair enough, you're obsessed and you're a weirdo, but why should we care? Because typically people are interested in stuff like this in the sense of the big picture question, how the whole thing is coming about. Um, talking about dark component in there in the form of possibly black hole. We typically have smaller ones, bigger ones. Is there anything in between? There is a strong expectation for having intermediate mass black hole at the center of these kinds of objects. And then going back to the statements uh, initially on what should we make about our understanding of the kinematics in the very outskirts? Is this something that we should be using as a probe for unseen component, possibly in the form of mini aerobot? In my case in here is the fact that we should get the physics uh, or the understanding of the basic physics first and then try to make a statement. But I'll give you a little preview on some ongoing work on this particular three big question. And this, of course, is just the sort of magazine view of why global cluster are relevant in this context, because they are old, they are really fossils. They probe possibly even the epoch of realization to some degree. And so there is a particular emphasis nowadays, especially thanks to James, type of science to try to probe this regime even direct. So this is precisely the direct approach. We should just go in and observe them. And this has been done even, this was a free web type of statement. The expectation for the, and of course, I mean, half of you are doing star formation, and you know this kind of thought even better than I do. But this was the expectation at the time in which we just had the Benzel probable to cluster be detected. So these few points over here and the rest were kind of expectation of highly magnified sources. And now these are the first outcomes from cycle one type of studies in the sense that this is just one case that I, that I was picking up and there are others and I'm not fully up to date with literature, I apologize. Uh, but progressively we are really populating this mass size plane with things that may be, we may be tempted to call protoglobulars. And typically they tend to have a size that is at least one order of magnitude higher in regards to the local universe counterpart, and a bit more massive, but, but not by more than two order of magnitude. And of course, this is the whole business about what is a global, what is <laughs> a dwarf, uh, especially in the early years. But this is if someone is trying to make a statement over a direct observation, that to me is still science fiction at this stage, in the sense that I was brought up in an era in which <laughs> it didn't exist. <laughs> So what I do instead is the kind of inverse problem, something you also mathematically. But the idea that you have features that are available to you in a local old cluster and you want to try to reconstruct the, the initial information. So there is a, an idea of hysteresis, memory of the system, 
for feature that do have an inference from the initial prediction point. So uh, this is one particular highlight in the case of two population cluster, which is the business of the most population cluster that I introduced, for which we were lucky enough to make a measurement of the two rotation curve. And then one should really ask the question, how is this coming about? How long is this preserved for? How can we make use of this in the reconstruction of so just one piece of, of uh, information here, which is just an extract from a full thesis from, from uh, Maria Tioco, who dedicated a lot of uh, computing time and mental time into this. One can try to precisely play this exercise in doing an embody study in this particular case, in which we were starting, this is a representation of the rotation curve as a function of radius, a different time scaled in the same funny way, so this is initial half mass relaxation time, capturing the long-term evolution uh, of your system and see how long would it take to progressively lose memory because can be a rotation per two populations that are looking like one another ultimately obviously this is the expectation but this is a very very long time scale and on the order of a few of these relaxation times because they often can go up to the point of core collapse which is quite far into the system the life of the system then this you can still separate this so one can argue that if you have a good idea for what would be the mechanism shaping your initial condition for rotation and isotopy, all this kind of complexity, then you should be able to not say everything is going to be in a good moment. Some information will preserve itself. So, on the question number two, as I was anticipating, we know obviously that there are a lot of small stellar like coal at this point in this the whole industry that I was mentioning in the field. We know that the big one exists. Uh, also very, very confirmed at this point. The whole business is what to do with the aging in phase so intermediate mass play. And the strong expectation here is precisely to have, if you want to correlate the mass of your host system with respect to the mass of your expected black hole, by lower mass extrapolation, you should be expecting these things to exist at the same time. No detection so far, a lot of frustration. I should we're debriefing this in the morning. But the hope is still very much up because it's it's a puzzle and there is I think a series of physical reasons that are an expectation. So the contribution that uh, we are trying to offer to the debate is another class of models that do rely on on simple mathematics, and this is precisely the F from K that I showed at the beginning. What we did was just a tiny modification in the boundary condition that you need to put in place when you're solving your PD. Which is an ODE in this case because I always still expect a significant instance. And the modification comes in in the form of normally when you're solving a classical P model, this is just a zero. So it means that there is a core profile. And all the freedom in the shape of your solution goes into this capital psi, which is the depth of your potential. And normally this is evaluated at the origin, so small epsilon. What we did was to bring a small epsilon, which is meaning to carve a little hole around the origin to avoid this for a number of good reasons, GR, degree of uh, well posedness of isotropy, and just the fact that you have a singularity mathematically that you want to stay away from. So this is a genuine dimensionless form radius of avoidance, which is a small epsilon parameter in mathematical sense. And you're bringing in this slope, which is bringing in the information of the black hole mass in dimension is here. So you look at this and you say, well, this is an ODE. I, I mean, I know how to do this. It's easy enough. Uh, and it will take an afternoon to solve it. It took us three years to do the asymptotic. <laughs> in the sense that really the numerics was simple to understand fully. But when you're solving your system and you're representing the extension of your solution, which is the boundary, the physical truncation radius for, for your solution as resulting from this uh, ODE here, and you're plotting this as a function of the mass, with respect to, I'm giving surprisingly, there's a critical point here. So, mass with respect to this central value, which is critical. And you want to plot this set of models here corresponding to the blue curve. You see, there is a dramatic variation between something that is sufficiently extended up to a maximum. This is a genuine radius. And then it goes up here and then collapses down and eventually falls down. There is a significant variation. If you plot the mass of the cluster with the total mass of your solution, this is corresponding to the orange curve, so there is a transition. So the idea is that anything on the left corresponds to 
a cluster for which the mass of the black hole is less than the mass of the surrounding stars. The other side corresponds to the the black hole mass is what we need to move with all the reporting budget. And usually we tend to operate in normal situations with normal models in the two extremes here. Either have a tiny black hole that is more or less in there and is superimposed with respect to your dimensional model that you're putting in without doing the calculation of some ground. Or you're in the regime which is almost like a Clarion situation, so a dominant central mass and just a sprinkle of stars that are not really responding to their own self ground to the money. And the regime in the middle, which is where things are more or less 50 50 or literally 50, is usually never touched or never touched in the sense of calculating genuine self gravity, which is the purpose of the exercise. So there is this dramatic change in, in, in structure of the solution that also turns out to be something that you can understand in the phase transition in the statistical sense, which I'm not going to explain. I'll leave this in another video. But in principle, it's kind of carrying a significant meaning uh, in a form that I wasn't expecting. And Sam, the lovely PhD student who's suffering through all this, had to come up with an asymptotic approach for, for a descriptive asymptotics over three regimes that you see represented here for this gray area that has a number of on the side, another blue one, and then finally the real proximity to physicality, which involved uh, a logarithmic. Um, a singularity that, that was hidden in there that you cannot quite see. So this is the reason why we took us three years to actually do the job. But is it, it just to say that this understanding for this transition behavior is well focused and has a mathematical root that also allowed us to come up with a close form for the critical. So this this will appear, uh, and he did also the corresponding rotating case, which carries another uh, parameter. So it's just to say that this can be done. And it's still a family paper exercise that just requires a little bit of patience. Final question, uh, I'm almost at the end. This is related to the start matter business and what should we do or not do about the kinematics in the outer region. And I've already made the case that, that cosmologists are getting worried about this. Observational people are just discovering stuff and we don't quite know how to name them uh, and all the implication of having this. So we did another exercise with another public PhD student in Edinburgh who is now finished. Uh, and this was an early universe type of exercise. So we measured uh, a series of substructure in one uh, cosmological simulation available to us. Uh, don't ask me any details, this is not my, my area. It's, I was just going in agnostically uh, with Fred to, to do this exercise. So this is represented here as the demographics. And this is a fraction of variance. This is a fraction of standard mass. This means essentially with some degree of unseen component to a dark matter. This is probably no dark matter at all. And we are trying to call this stripe corresponding to see the possible proper proper cluster, but as I said, defined in a fully agnostic sense. And there are a couple of follow up that we also try to do as well, the dynamical characterization of the process. But as I say, this is as good as any other study, proper proper cluster. And I don't kind of attach any particular emotional involvement to this study, but to the student, of course, yes. Uh, but the whole idea is that we should be starting to ask this question of who's who and when in a uh, sort of agnostic way, just because the whole idea of uh, the two classes of object is particularly blurry. But if you do allow some degree of dark matter in something that is still a collisional system in the spirit of what I just described, and we did this experiment with another person in Edinburgh a few years ago, um, and you want to particularly ask the question, should I be able to generate an envelope of stars of this kind of what we're seeing through the Gaia uh, membership assessment? Um, this is the kind of expectation that we can have by allowing this dark matter potential to be available in the surrounding of our collision system. And we are allowing just two body relaxation to take place. So this is um, particularly limited information I realized. But the idea is that if you're allowing ejection and evaporation to take place in the absence of any surrounding meaningful, of course you're going to lose energy in the sense of energetically unbound themselves stars. So there is no chance of generating a substantial energy. Progressively, if you allow yourself to have some fraction of the total mass in the form of your unseen component, and the more you add, the more course, you're able to trap energetically stars into this kind of parking lot uh, that is available. This is, as I said, a very cartoon-like version, but you have 
faith-based argument for market failure paralysis. And of course, if you then ask, this is a stationary argument, if you ask, what about the collisional evolution of an object of this kind, and hybrid situation where I still have collisionality and I'm having a certain fraction of the mini halo available to me? This is changing the whole picture with implication on core collapse and other things that are related to the possibility of, of collisional systems. But also, there is work in progress, so I feel skeptical of myself uh, around this model and just present implication. And a word of caveat, and really, I'm at the end. If you want to play the game of interpreting the kinematics in the outskirts, uh, in the spirit of what we were saying, is staying flat, is going upward, is going down. Uh, we should keep in mind always that even the classical nature of the tidal perturbation, no mini halo in this case, just a genuine tidal effect available to, to the environment, um, implies non trivial behavior. So, this is yet another <laughs> incarnation. I know you're familiar with this now. <laughs> of the distribution function, where now the modification comes in the form of the argument. This is the Jacobi integral, which is just a particular combination of energy and angular momentum that you are available to you when you are considering the simple case of a global cluster onto a circular orbit, which experience your, is experiencing at this point the stationary type. And in that case, this is what your global cluster would look like. It's a rugby ball instead of a sphere. And these are precisely the two Lagrangian points from which you start generating the chaos once you are going uh, beyond the, the energetic boundary of the space. But this means that there is already an elongation that is intrinsic to just the physics of this tidal perturbation in its simplest case. And then if you want to do even more kind of refined considerations that are needed for this kind of collisional dynamics, we should be aware that there is a whole population of weirdos that we usually technically call potential escapers, which is a chunk of the stars that are energetically unbound, and you should think of this as just the outcome of this energy transport um, within the cluster itself. That is so slow that is happening and progressively pushing any star that is in the proximity of your energy critical value, in its proximity even more so, but yet not to the point of allowing the, system, the, the stars to escape from the energy. So the outcome of this is that you are energetically unbound, but still spatially confined. And how do they look like in the talking of loss and dispersion of functional radius, precisely like the last bias loss and dispersion? So this should be taken into account, and we need to do cal a calculation for one particular model, of course, but convoluted in, in its mathematical structure, so it's not, it's not presented to you. But it's just to say that in principle, we do have this rule to capture even something that is, is we have a family of potential escapers, and we know are there because we've been seeing them. All the simulation for the decades. So the, the whole debate around mini halo, yes or no, is much more subtle than sometimes it's presented in, in the headline. So thank you very much for your patience. We covered a lot of ground. This was astrometry, some gravitational wave stuff, the embodied problem, cosmological simulation, a lot of laughing and some mathematics as well. Um, this was the set of the big questions that, that I think people care about. And my answer is often coming in the form of the small system and the fact that we have a way to use classical tools and principles to understand it. So really this is the end uh, in terms of the main messages. And the tagline to me is really that, of course, we all want to go to the complex stuff, but we can get to the complex stuff if we understand the basic first. And I'm still understanding the basic at the moment. So thank you very much. Thank you, Annalisa, for your very nice talk. Um, so, questions? Uh, yes. Uh, it, it, it's really cool to see the interplay uh, between um, observations and theory simulations uh, for the both globular clusters. And of course, with, with more data, do, yeah. you, do you have an expectation where the the bottom is on either side. <laughs> it, it will be, really be this interplay again. Yeah. So I, I guess that um, spectroscopic follow up to web type of observation is one practical problem. And I've been told that we need to have EELPs type of science in order to be able to do anything that is a spectroscopic counterpart to what we do in the universe. 
um, this is key not just because we want to have a state, right, but because we want to have state neutral mass before. And this has already been partly done in respective states. But I think that for me to believe into any determination of the actual masses of people, then even more so as we say, a fraction of for believing in these all being photovoltaics in the form of gas versus the form of stars as a way of whatever ratio you know, being picked. This is key in order to make any statement of plausibility for dynamics. And also then if you want to take the conversation between the most extended population groups, that is really the key one to try to address directly. Um, this is linked to the point that it's a much dilution. We need to involve them in a clear scenario. We understand this, we have an uh, effective relationship. So this is to me the bottleneck on which to have reliable dynamical masses and able to do so. One needs to have reliable processes, and it would take time. But of course, people would be doing this faster than photometric uh, extrapolation of the masses and, and then the money. Um, but anything that is a well computation thing. And on the numerics, it's just to be honest about <laughs> our numerics, especially for coming from the technological side, on what we understand where the pressure of the pieces go there. Solve the name anything that is just in various and not physics. And I think in practical terms, this means that, of course, I won't be able uh, with my gravitational and body stuff to scale this up to anything, even at more than the galaxy. Um, but I get very upset when people say, oh, yes, with something physics, we can capture it. <laughs> you cannot even get core collapse, obviously. So it's, it's, it's not just being fixated on my end. Just to be realistic about the kind of physics that one can resolve or not. So I think that there is complicated. But the bottleneck is just the fact that we don't have the machinery in place that can allow us to bridge this huge difference in scale. And yeah, we need to be thinking about this in several ways. <laughs> but I, 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 I'm not that kind of person who, I mean, they can come up with some way of cutting integrators and things like this, but this is a huge job. In the same spirit in which it was already so complicated, there are gas and hydro with respect to direct integration of stellar. Still very incomplete. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions about the Q versus alpha phase space. Yes, please. So um, I was wondering in this space space, uh, what fraction of this space is populated by known clusters? <laughs> is this an ongoing problem to populate it? It's an ongoing problem to populate it in the sense that in order to make any statements on Q, you need to have an exotically measurable group that. And this is going back to yes, now we have um, astrometry from Gaia, some archival line of sight information. So this means three dimensional velocity space. This is great. This is the kind of thing that we need in order to say any beta on the profile that one can eventually translate to Q if one likes it. But the, the whole point is. I'm never going to have something that is an ice cream sphere. This is me being a paranoid <laughs> person and just looking for instability. But the majority, I, I think, is going to be in probably this region. And this is why I'm actually obsessed about kind of dissolving any sort of you know, slowly growing, finding stability in the swarm that's going to spread. So anything is not going to be extreme in any flavor of, uh, is, of uh, an isotopy. And the space in rotation, I think, is the one that you visit. It will be populated different uh, within different classes of objects. Um, so not everything is going to be maximally rotating objects, but we know that it, as, as you start to result, some stuff do show rotation at early stages, later stages as a remnant. So one can even think of trajectories in the evolutionary states for a star and cluster that is starting at a certain point and basically walking to a variety of configuration, but this is. It's just a kind of a mathematical tool more than anything else, and, and an excuse for us to explore it in the direction that we kind of avoid it. Yeah. What would you expect any cluster to be near these stability areas, or is this more kind of the theoretical? Well, I, I, I generally don't know in terms of anything that is an extreme mutual setup, uh, in the sense that, um, it, well, this is your business, even mine. This is a situation where there are systematic motion in one particular direction that are stronger than we expected it to be before. Um, so maybe they will start with more extreme degree of both Q and R 
So then they move them evolve as, as I showed you in the case of the two rotation for you know, patient is something that is more normal looking in that aspect. But we don't know, we cannot exclude this a priori from the design of the Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions? And Johnny, are there any online questions? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Can you just indicate it as um, what does the system evolve into once it becomes a status? I never said it, it's not positive on you. Um, you when I talk about instability here, so I should have given offered this definition. This theta there is a growth rate for uh, just a pure exponential mode. So it, it's the real part of the exponential thing. So this is scaled or or just capturing um, M2 mode, so bars. So the thing that you will see as a result is a sphere with a cigar inside, which we are still exploring in the long-term perspective in the sense that it's a saturation, especially for the highly unstable saturation, you really get a saturated mode and you simply stay there. As even higher resonance um, or higher harmonics resonances, so it shows up in M4, M6, eight, lower amplitude. So this is the dominant one that, that is merging. Um, but the whole point is that if you're allowing this to go longer, so these are kind of secular time scale for longer things like this, the bar gets eroded progressively at times. Um, and it's not obvious, I mean, as I said, I'm still trying to put together an understanding for the formation of the model, the instability of the model themselves, how they, they should then evolve, uh, as I said, an interplay of long term evolution, regional effect, and everything else. So, so it would be exploring mm -hmm. itself, I guess. Um, I guess it's something that, as far as I'm aware, nobody knows this about uh, <laughs> uh, So perhaps we can do something from the fact that we haven't seen it. No, well, um, Yes and no, in the sense that I take the point, and, and this is precisely what was a big thought that I might use. A global cluster is global. True, uh, we actually should be doing the measurement of this better. The, the, the last catalog that has been done seriously about just morphological characterization in white control 1987 in a coherent way. And now we do have scope for doing this. Since, of course, it's not going to be an elliptical galaxy, like stay next to Higgs. But the statement that uh, this is perfectly round is false. In the sense, we typically have an expectation for the steel of 0 0.2 to 0 0.4. It says nothing headline or anything, but, but still is not fully very open. Uh, and this is not relevant to this particular setting. It's more relevant regarding careful more than one we want to do in both the implementation, the isotopy, and the parity characterization. So I'm, I'm generally not expecting things. Over cluster to become unstable. <laughs> I don't want to spread false information. This is, is really a theoretical exercise to show that there are regime of instability that we don't usually account for. And I, I don't see this being relevant for any realistic over cluster in terms of going and being convincing like this bar at the center of 47 cluster. This is not the point of the second. Um, is, is be aware that there are this design for, for initial equilibria that do carry information that we normally don't, don't really consider. And if anything, I kind of approach any stability problem or analysis in the spirit of reducing the size of the parameter space that is sensitive, so that I will stay away from anything that is becoming unstable now that I know that it is. From the point of view of saying, I'm not allowed to do. A dynamical model that is allowing myself extreme level of tangentiality that sometimes is actually happening in the dwarf galaxy from people that are saying, well, this is what my genes decomposition is returning. And I don't know what to make of this tangential and exotic, but it's a favorable model to the statistical point. So uh, it's more for that kind of science that I'm motivated to explore this and just for the mathematical pleasure of it. <laughs> but this is not really relevant directly for. for Global cluster science. The best is about the impact on four collapse. I think it is. It says that these are effects. It says the displacement between the red and the blue on one side and the blue on the side is something that is more of interest to the global science.
and also here we are doing the answers here just because of that point of course in the three minutes and to prove the point that there is an actual saving no no I'll have to try and find no <laughs> indeed <laughs> So I've got another question. So uh, I guess we should let it be at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess a lot of these models apply to uh, clusters in quasi equilibrium. And how much in quasi equilibrium do you need to be before these models can be applied? Does it have to be serialized? Does it have to have the yeah. several dynamic time scales? Yeah, it's, it's essentially <laughs> the thing on, on uh, the important issue. How collisionless pools fitting into collision models. I think that one can always argue, well, you can, you can take something as an instantaneous representation of a certain moment, like kind of resolution of the object. I think that um, it really depends more seriously on, on the degree of complexity they are trying to capture. So if you're thinking of a young object, uh, which is still carrying a lot of information and probably showing messy in the markets. Uh, I think that I would not be too fast about applying something like this to a kind of characterization of that particular instantaneous representation. I wouldn't attach an evolution of meaning to it. That would be just something that is a tool that goes in for that particular moment in time and is kind of giving you a representation of the full dynamic picture. Sure. Asking whether it should be applying um, a model of crop collapse to something that is at a certain dynamical state, very unique, 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 very un